Buongiorno a tutti, siamo pronti per fare una nuova diretta di questa giornata. Siamo molto felici perché avremo tra noi un grandissimo soprano, Lisette Europesa, e aspettiamo che si, con, si connetta. Eh, vi ricordo di continuare a guardare il nostro calendario che sarà sempre aggiornato perché anche nell'altra pagina di Opera Life USA ci sarà la possibilità di vedere altre dirette. Infatti cominceremo da domani già con Federica Vitali e proseguiremo con Adriana Gomez e moltissimi altri. Quindi rimanete collegati e andate anche su quel profilo. Nel frattempo vedo se Lisette si connette aspettiamo un attimo e appunto vi dicevo che ci saranno uh, delle, delle dirette congiunte ovviamente questa sarà in lingua inglese ovviamente l'isete madre in lingua inglese quindi questo, questo facciamo oggi invece domani con Federica Vitali sarà in italiano quindi aspettiamo Uh, nonostante sia la pagina USA, ci saranno delle dirette comunque in italiano e in inglese. Hello! Ciao Alessandra, hello! Ciao! How are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm at home. I was just fixing my connection so that it doesn't have any problems for us, but I think it's perfect now. Yes, I see perfect you, okay? <laughs> great. great, I see you well too, perfect. Okay. Ciao a tutti, ciao amici, <laughs> sono Lisette. Uh, and you now you are in New York or where are you now? No, I'm in Louisiana, Louisiana. in my home in Baton Rouge, yes. Ah, perfect. And what do you do in your day for for this quarantine time? Well, um trying to keep working on anything. I'm still singing uh when I can. It's not easy to get the motivation every day to sing, but I'm trying to find a motivation every day to um at least work on the future, plans for the future. So I'm communicating a lot with my managers and putting together ideas for my album that I'm working on and all of that, you know, trying to just keep um, thinking about the future, not thinking about now <laughs> so much, you know. Job, job, job. <laughs> Yes, job, job, job. That's right. Just trying to think positive. And I'm running. Here we can still go outside. So um, because we have space, uh, so they are letting people walk and run outside. So I'm still going outside to run um, five days a week. So it's something discipline, you know, um, and, you know, cooking. We always do this anyway. We always cook. We always run. So it hasn't it, in that way. It doesn't feel so different. Yes, it's beautiful. I have seen a lot of picture that you run. And uh, for, for you, it's good uh, run, make exercise for singing. Yeah. Yes, very. I've always thought that it was very important for singing that you have good physical health, especially your lungs and your heart. Because on stage, you're nervous sometimes and your heart starts to do this. <laughs> and if you are healthy, your heart will not do so fast. It will go a little less and it's not so, um, so difficult to manage being on stage if you are used to being a lot from exercising it helps you know um and also just the the stamina that you need for opera the endurance that you need for opera you get a lot of it with exercise you train your body to be used to the stress and the difficulty of three hours in opera or four hours of an opera you from running you become more tolerant Yes, yes. How many kilometers you you run? Uh, let's see. I do between maybe and okay, okay. So Stephen is saying we do 35 a week. 35 <laughs> per week. So I try to split it in five days uh, almost every week. So it's about seven kilometers a day, depending on how we feel. I try not to be too hard on myself, but I'm trying to always make 35 a week at least. Wow, it's incredible, absolutely wow. incredible. Okay, uh, I want to start with a question, and uh, the first question is, when start your passion for the opera? Well, um, 
When I was younger, my mom was a singer. In fact, I've shown videos of her singing or I was listening to her singing. And so she always had a beautiful voice and I always really liked hearing that, but I never wanted to do for myself. I wanted, to, I thought that was her dream. And so I wanted to do something different. So I started playing the flute for many years and I played, I played I, the piano. Oh yeah? Too, yes. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yes, well. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I wanted Go. to play and, and I was in orchestra and I was in band. And then I realized that uh, even though I was still singing at home, I was singing in church. I, uh, I decided that to go to college, I had to choose something, you know, voice or the flute and my voice, even though I was playing flute a lot, my voice was always better. Like my voice was just always a better talent, I guess you could say, excuse me. <laughs> Ew. Excuse me. I have allergies. <laughs> I have allergies. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So I, I so I gave up the flute and I began singing in university. And then that's it. I became 100% in opera and classical music for singing. And, and I'm very happy that I did that. Yes. Beautiful story. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, um, in what what is your favorite opera and what is your favorite characters and mm -hmm. what is uh, your favorite author um author like uh, literature or author of like composer like composer. music okay composer. allora my favorite opera is probably le nozze di figaro I think it's the most beautiful thing ever written. Um, my favorite characters. I really like Traviata and I really like Gilda. I think they're very strong people who make difficult decisions. And I really like, uh, for composers, I love Mozart. Mozart for me is numero uno, always has been and always will be. But I love, I love also Belcanto. I mean, I love Donizetti. I love Rossini. I love Bellini. I love Verdi. I mean, these are, and I love the French composer. So I start to like everything and then it becomes impossible to choose a favorite. But I always say Mozart is my favorite. Okay. And uh, uh, what advice you can give for the person that never go in the theater? When uh, I don't know, uh, I one person say I want to go to the opera, but I don't know which is better for start, which is yeah. for the opera most e most easy for start. I think the best first opera for everybody is Rigoletto, because Rigoletto is a great story. It's short. It's a lot of passion, a lot of drama. It's like a movie. Um, and really also pretty much any opera of Puccini, I think is a good first opera. Suor Angelica, you know, um, Gianni Schicchi is really good. Anything from Tritico is good, great for the first time because it's like a movie. Even Tosca, you know, it's like a movie. It's really just boom, boom, boom. It's like watching a, a film. And so I think for people who aren't sure where to start, maybe um, don't start with Wagner take time to get to Wagner and read the stories first before you do Wagner. But, um, but I really think Puccini is a great, a great start from Orrigo Little. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what do you think about the Traviata? I have, because I have seen you in the Traviata in Arena di Verona last year, the yeah. last uh, by Zeffirelli. And uh, was very particular this Traviata because uh, start with the die to Violetta. What do you think about this? It's very strange uh, that the the Zeffirelli died and uh, this this opera start in this way. What do you think about it? I think it's great, actually. I think to start with the death and have her whole the whole opera be like a flashback of her life. I think is very smart because. The music in the beginning, the overture, is very similar, the same, almost to the music before she's dying, the chords. Um, so this tells us that Verdi was already there. If the prelude didn't sound like the third act, if the prelude just went, if we 
had gone there first, you would start with the party. You don't start with the death. But he starts with the death, is what Verdi writes. So it's like he's already telling us, this is a person who's sad. This is a person who's dead. This is a person who's suffering. And also in the book, she's dead in the beginning. And we go backwards and we tell the story. So I think it's very, um, it's very true to, to the real story, the way, we, the way it was written. And I think that this is, this is great. This is how it should be done, actually. And, the, and the, this is the last traviata of Zeffirelli, no? Yeah. And strange, this situation that, no? And yeah. uh, Phil, um, what do you feel when you think about uh, this traviata uh, to the Zeffirelli die, to the Zeffi die, the Violetta died? What's I know. Yeah, and actually on the stage, the bed that she sitting that she's sitting in in the beginning it's up on the top of the stage so the stage has like this bottom level and then this high level up on the high level there's a bed that Violetta sits on in the beginning and then she leaves the bed and she comes down to the bottom but that bed was the original bed from the movie of Zeffirelli Traviata with Teresa Stratas and Domingo it's the same bed So when I sat in the bed, and I only had to sit in it for a moment, I wasn't in it a lot because it's old, right? So, and it's like antique, it's very special. So, but I sat in the bed and I'm thinking, oh my God, Teresa Strata sat in this bed and Zahida <laughs> probably sat in this bed and all these people, it was like a ghost story. It was really cool. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, um, how uh, do you deal with a new rule? Well, a new role, I try to make as many things about it familiar as I can. So, for example, if someone is offering me a new role of bel canto, I know I have sung bel canto. I know I've sung in Italian. I know I've studied how to sing this way. So I try not to be afraid of the fact that it's new. Oh, my God, it's new. You know, many times I've seen the opera before. It's an opera I've heard of, an opera that I know. So I can read about the opera. I can watch the opera many times. You know, now we have the internet. We can watch anything, right? We go on YouTube and watch anything we want, just about. Um, so I try not to be afraid. I try, not, I try to think of the things that I, that I know. And then I begin, I go through the score. I go through the story first, the text. And I make sure that I'm translating. I can translate everything. I know what everything means. So I don't have any questions. Um, and then I begin looking at what seems to be the most difficult part of the music. If sometimes it's the big scena, you know, uh, uh, sometimes it's ensemble, a finale. <laughs> sometimes it's a duet that is very difficult. Uh, I, and usually, I find, the easiest part of the role is the aria. Usually, not always, sometimes not true depends on the role it really but i try to find the parts of the role that are i know are going to take time to really learn and really practice like complicated like recitativo for example i always make sure that i begin always not skipping the recitativo and going to the aria but always really study the recitativo because this is usually where the story happens and the conflict happens and the drama is happening is in the recit so it's important that you begin with this and then you go to the easy part of the aria and the, you know not not everybody likes to practice the parts that they sound pretty as singing <laughs> but i try to practice the parts that are ugly <laughs> that i sound ugly <laughs> important yeah. for the younger recitativo it's important not only sing aria 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 but study good recitativo yes yes beautiful advice for the person yeah. that study a new role Yeah. And after you practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you, then you can begin to memorize. Um, you begin to find, um, because not only you have to practice it, you have to memorize it. You have to be able to sing it with no music. And then you just, the way I practice memorizing is many ways. So for example, I can write the text. And once I'm in a good, I've been singing the role a lot, and I'm ready to start memorizing, The next step for me is to write. So I take a pencil and a piece of paper and I will write all of my text as wow. though I was reading it to myself from the beginning, all of it. And where I know there's a problem, I, oh, I can't forget, how does this go? Then I know I'm not already memorized. So I do just one scene at a time, not like all at once, you know? So like when I was doing Manon, I did this. So I did with the first, 
scene of Manon. Okay, try to write down everything. That's hard because Manon talks a lot and it makes you realize how complex the text can be. Even if the music is very lyric, the text, if it does not repeat itself, which sometimes it does not, writing it really helps you because writing somehow like connects something extra in your brain that mm -hmm. you cannot get just from singing, but you get it from writing because of some, and then you can save your voice. So I do this. And then once I've done that and I know I'm writing and it's all memorized because I can write it perfectly, then I can begin just singing it, getting it into the voice, taking turns. You know, I, I don't really sing too much at the beginning. I sing more later in the process because for me, if it's here, this will happen. Okay. If I don't know here what I'm doing, this does not know what to do. I have to control this. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to know, you have to have your remote control where you're going to go. <laughs> Otherwise you start going everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and your voice will get used to doing something wrong if you're not really sure what you're doing. Like if you make the same mistake five or six times, stop. Analyze why you're making the same mistake so that you stop making it. Otherwise you will never stop making the same mistake. So it's the kind of things like you don't want to make a habit unless you know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Yes, it's a very strong works in in the in the opera. You you study a lot, and it's very important to understand what what happened for you. No? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, for you, is the most important technique or heart? <sighs> you know, there are artists that are all heart and no technique or very less technique. And there are artists who are all technique and no heart. And I can tell you, I think in the end of, at the end, to have heart is always more important. But the problem with having heart and less and not caring about technique is you will not last. Your voice will not, will start to shut down, will start to have problems. And this is why technique has to be there first. And then you can bring all the heart you want and your technique will support you. It's kind of like having, what's more important, the top half of your body or the lower half of your body? Well, you need both because if you only have one, <laughs> you can't go anywhere. But if you only have the bottom, you don't, you can go everywhere, it doesn't matter. So it's like you really, honestly, if you can find a balance so that your technique can serve the heart. But what I do think, here's what I do think, honestly. I think technique can be taught. I don't think heart can be taught. Real musicality, real feeling and emotional connection to music, you either have this or you do not. So for some artists who do not have it, they can learn all the technique in the world and sing and nobody is moved. It might be impressed. Wow, that's an amazing singer. She can do this and this and this and so many notes and maybe she's a perfect piano. Maybe she's a perfect uh, intonation. Maybe she's fabulous coloratura, she, he, whoever. But if that person does not bring something to connect to people, to the public, there is no amount of school that will teach them. So I feel like people always try to uh, look for artists who have heart first and then you can build your technique on this it's just my opinion <laughs> thank you thank you very much yeah. okay um for have a good technique what is the most important things in the technique i don't know brief for you uh, projection of the sound for you mm -hmm. what is the most important things and what in uh, what uh, particular uh, part of the technique you have mm, work more? I think the most important thing for vocal technique is the breath, the support and the connection to the body. Because this, this is, this will build with time. But if this, if this has to be connected to the breath, otherwise this will work too hard and will become very tired. So for many years, I was not thinking about my breath. And when I started taking yoga class, years ago, uh, I started to think about the breath more consciously, like really focusing, okay, I'm inhaling and I'm exhaling, like thinking about it this way 
which I never used to do. I just never thought, oh, you just sing and it doesn't matter. No, you have to think about the breath and the support. At least I do. And so for me, that really helped me connect to my voice in a different way because I was more aware of what was going on in my body, in the rest of my body. Because your voice, as much as you think that it is alone, it is not alone when you are singing. Your voice is completely connected. It's connected to your brain and your emotions and your, your, your remote controlling is connected to this. It is connected to your heart and your emotions and your feelings. If you are unhappy, if you are very happy, if you are nervous, if you are excited, all of these things will reflect in your voice. And then it's connected to your breath because this is what makes it go. So anything that you do not do or do do in your breath will come out in the voice. This is why it's important to be aware, maybe not necessarily controlling, but at least aware of what your body is doing. So for example, I, there are certain positions I don't like to sing in. Some directors want, for example, let me see if I can move this. Some directors want, for example, you to sing on your back with your head back like this. <laughs> I've had directors ask me to do that. And I say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. They say, well, why not? So-and-so can do it. And I say, I'm sorry, I can't sing this way because this way my neck is like this and this is not free. Yes. This needs to be in a line for me, this. So mm -hmm. if, so those are the kinds of things I can say, no, I'm sorry, I don't, I won't do that. I can sing laying down, fine, as long as this is supported. I can sing kneeling on the floor like this, fine. But this way, no because it's not good for the body. It's not good for the physical body. So for me, those types of things, you know, you have to be aware of what, how your voice will react to every position. Some singers, for example, don't like to run upstairs and then have to sing, but they ask us to do this all the time. So once in a while, you might have to figure out, okay, how can I sing if I'm like, <laughs> if I'm out of breath? This is why running is helpful. <laughs> One reason why running is helpful, you know, so, I mean, because like I said, the body, the body and the voice are connected. They are one, they are completely together. If something is not working, this is why if you're sick, you have a hard time singing. This is why if you're unhappy and crying, you have a hard time singing. It's all of these things, it, it all goes here. Yeah, and you have uh, some exercise that you, you do with, for the brief? Well, yes, I do try to work on deep breathing as much as I can. And I think singers already do this without having to exercise it. Singers breathe very deeply. So when I'm in bed at night before bed, before going to sleep, I try to notice if I'm breathing very fast or very deep and slow. And so that's the other thing that's very important. You have to rest. You have to rest. It's, you know, people want to work very hard and get up early in the morning and do everything and then be up all night singing opera and then get no sleep. You cannot do that. You have to sleep. You have to let your body wind down and rest. So for me, at, it, at night before bedtime is when I'm doing the most breathing work. I'm laying there. I'm trying to let all of the thoughts go away. I'm trying to deep breathe. I'm trying to notice if I'm, if I'm anxious about something, if I'm worried about something, because this is when you feel all those things, right? When you're in bed and you're like, oh, tomorrow I have to do this. I have to travel. So-and-so said something to me that made me very unhappy. I didn't like this. Maybe I should have done that. You start having all this at, bed, at night. So this time, it must be sacred for you. It must be sacred. You must clear everything as much as you can even if it means reading for a little while or listening to meditation or listening to anything that will make you not be anxi have anxiety so that you can rest and your voice and your body can recover because then the next did not sleep well or if you were having anxiety your voice will go uh, i'm tired i don't feel good blah, blah, blah. yeah <laughs> your voice will fight you okay and uh, mm the the life in the in the stage it's very different uh, between the life the normal life no how you have the the balance you have the same person or when you go in the stage are different person what what do you think about it i do think it's a different person on stage a little bit than a real life person when you a real life person 
um, maybe is not focusing on everyone watching. You know, when I'm walking around in real life, I don't think everyone is looking at me. I have to be careful what I say and what I do. I don't care. I do what I want. But when I go on stage, the main difference is everyone is looking at you. You have to assume everyone is looking at you. So everything you do tells them something. And everything you do not do tells them something. So this is why when you are when you're on stage, you have to be very aware of what your colleague is doing. So you can listen to them and react to them. Because if you don't listen to them and react to them, the audience sees you not listening, which tells the audience that your character doesn't care about that person or your character is in another world. Or worse, your character is thinking about herself and her singing and not paying attention. You know what I mean? Like all these things, it sends a message to the audience because you're on a theater. So the audience is like really watching. So it's very important. And this is why it's hard. This is why it's difficult. This is why it's exhausting. Even if you don't sing one note, if you don't sing one note on stage all night, you will be exhausted just from this action of knowing you are being watched, consciously paying attention to your colleague, consciously paying attention to the conductor and the music, even if you don't sing. So it's, and knowing that you're being watched, it makes the anxiety of, oh, immediately higher. So it's adrenaline begins to go like, you know, and after you are done, you will have a crash. So it's, it's tough. It, that's why you have to find the technique it has to be as good as you can be so that everything else is on top of it can be supported. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, what uh, uh, advice you can give for the young that want to uh, uh, be a opera singer? Well, I think if you know that you want to sing, you really, really, really want to sing, then you should. But I think that if you feel some doubts and it's not really what you want, like really what you want, you shouldn't. Because I think for every, every person to have a success in life, you need something that you have a burning desire to have to do. It's kind of like, because opera is so difficult. If opera were an easy art form and anybody could be successful, I would say, don't, you know, anybody can do it. But it's not like that. Not anybody can do it. Only people who are passionate, exactly, opera soul are you, that's very true passionate, very devoted, ready to make sacrifices, because you will make sacrifices, ready to give up certain things, some comforts, some things that you're used to, you will have to change some things. So if you are passionate, and you are 100%, and you mean like, this is what you dream and love, then do it. But if it's not, don't. That's my advice. <laughs> and uh... Mm, what is the most important uh, lection that the music have given you? Well, music has taught me how to listen um, to things that are not in the words. Because like we were talking about Traviata, um, Verdi wrote a prelude in the first act. It sounds very much like the prelude in the third act. And he taught us to listen to this music with no text and feel something and in, interpret something. Whereas if it was just talk, 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 you'd have to read and think. And it's not about listening. It's about interpreting only. But having this music, we hear it and we feel something and we don't know how or why. We just do. It's like a natural thing. And I think music teaches us this. This is why the great composers live forever, because their music has some special element about it that can't be explained, but that is there. And you can't deny that it is there. And when you hear their music, you go, oh, I feel something, you know, and so it, this teaches you. It, it teaches you also to be a better listener in life about everything, about your, your surrounding. It teaches you to appreciate life. You appreciate the morning. You appreciate the night. You appreciate love. You appreciate, you know, um, your friends. 
anything small, you know, it's so it's kind of uh, music, music teaches us so many things. It, it, I, I can't even, that's just one lesson. M music teaches us hundreds of things, you know. Yes, and uh, mm, for the future, Lisette, what, uh, what do you want for the future? What do I want? for the world. I want everybody to get the hell out of their houses and not have a virus anymore. I want the world to be back to back better than it was before. <laughs> you know, I want, I, I just, I just want, I, I hope that everyone takes this time to learn to appreciate what we took for granted before. Maybe we took for granted, you know, um, being able to go out to a restaurant anytime we want. Maybe we took for granted being able to go with our friends to the theater anytime we want. Maybe we took for granted even seeing our parents and giving them a hug. Maybe we took these, we didn't, you know, care so much. We didn't realize how precious those moments are. But now we, that we can't do those things, we can't go out and we can't see our friends and we can't hug our parents and we can't just go to the mall and have fun. Um, we appreciate now more. So I hope that everyone, and I think that everyone will after this is over, in the future, that people will be more appreciative of these special things. Exactly. No, I've never loved life more, and that's very true. I feel the same. Absolutely. Life more, brava, Anila. Very true. I'm just looking at the comments. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, if you don't see, don't see this, I, I want to repeat, I because it's true. The, the life when you can do something, you understand the mean of the little things so the little the little simple part of the life no and yeah. it's, it's very important and we hope that the theater can open and the 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 shop the situation because uh i think that in this moment the person understand that we need to one which other no which other we need to the humanity yeah i, I agree want Yes. Okay. I want. To, I want to know if you have uh, one more hobby. You you run, and after you have said me that you cook. You cook. You have are a good cooker. Yes, I cook. I cook. Yes, I am a cook. I like to cook. Uh, what other hobby do I have? Um, I like. Um, I do like yoga. I haven't done as much as I used to. But I enjoy yoga very much. Those are kind of my main hobbies, though. I read. I do read. I like makeup. I love makeup. Okay, I want to see the, your makeup now. <laughs> oh. It's not that great. Yes. It's But so I love it. It's fun. It makes me happy. It makes me calm. <laughs> How many times for this, uh, this makeup? Um half an hour oh wow it's half an hour i mean for opera it takes two hours you know no, opera but... takes forever <laughs> <laughs> i need some powder actually because i'm a little bit uh i'm a little bit oily i need some polvo <laughs> oh no i i not very good and okay this is the best but but you don't need it you're perfect you're like so beautiful Like I'll take a model. <laughs> You're so sweet, but not this true, but fine. <laughs> um, I I want to know um, uh, when you if okay the finish the this situation when you come back to Italy for the, your it should be this fall September we're hoping for Arena di Verona. September, one performance in September. And then in the fall also, I cannot announce yet, but I'm hoping in the fall is the plan. So mm. end of the year. Speriamo. Speriamo, speriamo di sì. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. It's a very pleasure. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for this time. And uh, I hope that uh, in the future we can organize our Uh, direct uh, or interview with a group. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I hope to Madrid in the summer too. I hope. Madrid is trying to reschedule Flaviata. Flaviata in May probably will not happen. Just so someone was asking about this. 
So I just want to tell them. Oh, so. this person. Okay, in Moscow, pre the, there are... Pre uh, no, yeah. I don't have a plan for Moscow. I'm sorry. But Italy, yes. Madrid, yes, always. I will try to come back every year. And so we'll see when they, when they keep inviting. We'll see how things change. But I will always be announcing all these things. So <laughs> thank you. To. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao tutti. Ciao.